Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to The Global Current. I'm Priya Bave. And I'm Adeline Patterson. Today in news, anti-government protests sweep through Romania. And U.S. Defense Secretary Mattis visits Japan. The United States increases its involvement in Yemen with an overnight raid and deployment of naval destroyer. In analysis, fall army worms devastate crop harvests in Africa. And the impact that nationalistic and Eurosceptic movements are causing across Europe. And now, a report by Alexandra Prestamo on anti-government protests in Romania. Huge crowds have been protesting against Romania's new prime minister. Prime Minister Soren Grindinu has been in power for only three weeks. On January 31st, the Romanian government passed an emergency decree which pardoned certain crimes committed by people in power. In addition, the government secretly approved an ordinance which modified the penal code of Romania. Romanians have been protesting because the ordinance was intended for the decriminalization of government corruption. It would also help current and former politicians escape criminal investigations and prison sentences. The decree was repealed by the government, but the protests did not stop. Additionally, on February 9th, Romanian Justice Minister Florin Iodash has resigned after 10 days of rallies around the country. The resignation of the entire Social Democrat-led government is expected to continue next week. The first night that the ordinance was passed, more than 25,000 people protested. The next day, the protesters grew to 300,000 throughout the whole country. The protests have been labeled since the largest since the fall of communism. They have also been described as the largest protests in Romania, reaching their peak on February 5th, when between 500,000 and 600,000 people protested. Romania is considered a highly corrupt country, currently 57th on the Corruption Perceptions Index of Transparency International. In fact, the previous elected government was also brought down by protests in 2015. Many believe that despite years of anti-corruption efforts, Romania has not made significant progress against corruption. As the whole of the country watches, the long-term impact of the protests is not certain. Many of the people who have been protesting were present during the 2015 rallies, only to see the same people return to power. But Romanians have a reason to protest, and they do not plan on stopping until the government resigns. We're uh, determined to, uh, to resist, to uh, keep fighting, to keep fighting and, um, until the current government steps down. We believe that uh, they've lost credibility, not just with the Romanian people, but really with uh, other countries around the world. So it's time for them to go. For The Global Current, this is Liam Scollins reading for Alexandra Prestama. Up next, Jacob Abel brings us a report on the United States' involvement in anti-terrorism raids in Yemen. On January 29, 2017, U.S. SEAL Team 6, along with special forces from the UAE and Yemeni soldiers, launched what was supposed to be a surprise raid against a terrorist camp. The group targeted was Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or AQAP. The militants living in the camp were somehow made aware that U.S. forces were approaching and it is not clear how they knew, but some speculate that this may have been a low-flying drone or walkie-talkie chatter. The raid cost the life of Navy SEAL William Owens and the lives of about 30 civilians who died in the crossfire of the 15-minute long firefight between the two sides. The BBC reports that Nasser al-Awlaki, daughter of Anwar al-Awlaki, the prominent al-Qaeda leader, was also killed in the raid. 14 militants were also killed in the raid, along with three prominent figures in AQAP. CNN reports that a V-22 Osprey had to perform a hard landing after it was called in to support those service members engaged in the firefight, which injured another three U.S. service members. On February 6, NBC reported that the raid was actually seeking to target the leader of AQAP, but the mission failed in, the, in this aspect. Reports indicate that the terrorist leader managed to escape. Qasim al-Rimi, the leader of AQAP, even released an audio clip taunting President Trump. The president insists that the raid was a success, though many, including Senator John McCain, have called it a failure. It's hard to ever call something a complete success when you have the loss of life. But I think when you look at the totality of what was gained to prevent the future loss of life and against our people and our institutions and probably throughout the world in terms of what some of these individuals could have done, I think it is a successful operation by by all standards.
In another incident, the U.S. has deployed the destroyer USS Cole off the Yemeni coast after Houthi rebels launched an attack on a Saudi Arabian naval ship. CBS reports that the Houthis attacked the Saudi frigate using small suicide boats, killing two members. The USS Cole is the same ship that was attacked by al-Qaeda in 2000 when it was docked in a Yemeni port. That attack killed 17 U.S. sailors. The stated goal of the USS Cole is to protect passing vessels. However, some see the deployment of the Cole and the raid in Yemen as a broader strategy by President Trump to push back against Iran. Iran supports the Houthi rebels in the Yemeni civil war. President Trump's first few foreign policy decisions have been focused on the Middle East, so we will have to see if the U.S. shifts even more focus to the region. This is Jacob Abel reporting for the Global Current. Next this morning, Vincent Maresca reports on U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis' visit to Japan. On Saturday, February 2nd, United States Defense Secretary James Mattis reaffirmed the alliance between the Americans and the Japanese. According to the Defense Department, Mattis and his Japanese counterpart discussed defense and regional issues. With the security challenges from North Korea's nuclear program and China's behavior in the China Sea, the two countries pledged to work closely on those issues. Mattis also confirmed the United States' continuous support of Japanese administration of the Senkaku Islands in accordance with Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. When asked about China's construction of man-made islands, Mattis responded saying, What we have to do is exhaust all, all efforts, diplomatic uh, efforts, to try and resolve this properly, maintaining open lines of communication. And certainly uh, our military stance should be one that reinforces our diplomats in this regard. But there is no need right now at this time for military maneuvers. Before his visit to Japan, Mattis landed in South Korea, where he discussed nuclear security issues with South Korean counterparts. According to NHK News, Mattis warned the North Koreas while meeting with Defense Minister An min Ko. He said that any use of nuclear weapons will be met with an effective and overwhelming response. No word yet on North Korea's response to Mattis' warning. Finally, Mattis and Han min Ko agreed on plans for a missile defense in South Korea. Although Trump previously stated that Japan and South Korea should defend themselves, which would include acquiring nuclear weapons, Mattis praised Prime Minister Abe's increase in defense expenditure and agreed with Prime Minister Inada on a series of steps on realignment plans. For instance, reduction in American military presence on Okinawa and quote, relocating Marines to Guam, unquote. However, the Futenma U.S. military base on the island remains a disputed issue as the governor Onaga opposes American occupation. On the other hand, Mattis sees the relocation of the base as the only option to return, quote, the current Marine Corps air station on Futenma to Japan, unquote. This is Vincent Maresca reporting for the Global Current. Next up, Maddie Ruth reports on the destructive effect of fall army worms in Africa. The fall army worm is usually found in tropical regions of the Western Hemisphere. During the summer especially, it can fly long distances and feeds mainly on grass and sweet corns, of which the larvae eat nearly any vegetation in their path, similar to a marching army, which is where they get their name. While this species of army worm has previously only been found in the Americas, it has recently been discovered in Africa. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations published its concerns about the impact that the pests focusing on the impact of the harvest. Scientists believe that this specific strain of armyworms is more dangerous for the crops on the African continent than any native pest already existing in the region. The FAO sub-regional coordinator for Southern Africa described the situation as fluid and noted that the pest has most recently been detected in Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The most affected countries thus far are Zimbabwe and Zambia. 
Zambia has already spent up to $3 million in U.S. dollars trying to curb the outbreak. Over 100,000 hectares of farmland have been affected, and army planes are being used to spray pesticides, with District Agricultural Coordinator Joseph Fakatai saying, We might lose a crop up to 20% of the planted area, but uh, because we have known the problem and uh, we have reported to the relevant authority, uh, necessary chemicals have come in the district. Uh, almost 100% of the chemicals have come now. So we expect that we should be able to reduce that 20% loss to less than 10% and be able to have a good crop. In Zimbabwe, up to 70% of the country's farmland has been estimated to be affected, which includes land in seven out of eight of the provinces in the country. One of the major issues with the fall armyworm is that it tends to escape detection because as a larvae, it burrows inside maize stems. Farmers usually only look for caterpillars on the outside of plants. The hidden species is then able to lay six generations of around 50 eggs in a single area, which causes rapid colonization of an area. The government of Zimbabwe is attempting to distribute information and pesticides in order to combat the threat. However, the FAO describes it as difficult to control with a single pesticide, especially when in an advanced larval state, which makes it an even more dangerous threat. Part of the reason that this issue is such a large one is the fact that Southern Africa in the past year has been plagued by drought caused by El Nino. According to climate.gov, El Nino is a warming of the ocean surface or above average sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. The drought caused by El Nino is already affecting the harvest in many African countries. The fall armyworm is emerging in South Africa around the area where the drought is already severe. The maize, which is already affected by the drought, is going to be further affected by this pest outbreak. An agricultural department official was quick to make a clarification on the types of maize in effect in South Africa, stating, um, In other words, it's not a storage pest. And even if it would have been a storage pest, it would have been treated the same as all other storage pests. And in other words, it would be fumigated uh, where it's stored in, in, in silo bins. In other words, there's no scientific reason to prohibit the export of maize to other countries. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates that over half a million children are already suffering from a severe acute malnutrition because of the drought alone. It has also caused diseases, outbreaks, and reduced access to safe drinking water. The outbreak of the fall armyworms will only exacerbate the problems already severely felt by this region. If the outbreak continues to spread and affect the crops of the South African region, it could not only increase the negative effects of the drought, it could create new ones. Because of the lack of crops, it could force more and more children into forced labor in order to feed their families. This would cause them to drop out of school and be in more dangerous situations, which will then impact their lives in the future. The backlash from the outbreak of the fall armyworms has many implications for the people living in the affected regions. Even if the drought ends, the pest could continue the cycle currently in place that affects mainly children. Only through spreading information to farmers, as well as the aggressive use of pesticides, will hopefully be able to end this outbreak. In an effort to tackle this issue, the Food and Agricultural Organization is planning an emergency meeting in Zimbabwe that will outline the next steps in combating this issue. This is Maddie Ruth, reporting for The Global Current. And now, Jack LaForge brings us a report on nationalist and Eurosceptic movements across Europe. On Tuesday, February 7, 2017, German Chancellor Angela Merkel met with Poland's top leaders in an effort to persuade Poland to remain in the European Union despite the growing disdain and Euroscepticism spreading across the continent. The European Union has significantly weakened since the monumental Brexit referendum was casted in favor to leave the 28-nation union. Merkel stands as one of the strongest supporters of the European Union and speaks of the benefits remaining in the EU. We need to make sure that the European people can feel that the European Union wants to improve all of our lives. This is the task of the European Union and also of the different member states. Secondly, in a world that grows together more and more, the challenges are great, too great, so that individual countries may not cope on their own. In particular, Poland's Law and Justice Party has ratcheted up concerns about the European Union, but are not in favor of leaving the EU outright. 
Instead, the Law and Justice Party would like to rekindle an emphasis on fundamental Polish values and stray away from the perceived corrosive liberal and Western values of the EU, according to ABC News. The Law and Justice Party can be described as far-right and conservative, but are actually moderate when compared to the Eurosceptic parties emerging throughout Europe. According to BBC News, the Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy Party and the Europe of Nations and Freedom Group Party, who both describe themselves as Eurosceptic, hold nearly 11% of the seats in the European Parliament. Continually, national and Eurosceptic parties are doing the most damage in domestic government. I'd be failing to address the giant elephant in the room if I did not speak of Brexit, the referendum to leave the EU, which caused a momentous shift in British government policy. The campaign to leave the EU was adopted by the UK Independence Party, who bases their values on a strict anti-immigration policy and Euroscepticism. The UK Independence Party's former leader and most prominent spokesperson, Nigel Farage, spoke of the prospects of the European Union following the vote to leave in June. And so I'm thrilled that we've done this. Um, I believe the other big effect of this election is not what's happened in Britain, but what will happen in the rest of Europe. I mean, in the rest of the EU, Eurosceptic parties never talked about leaving the EU, now they are. An opinion poll in the Netherlands said that a majority there now want to leave. To leave. So we may well be close, perhaps, to Nexit. Uh, and similarly in Denmark, a majority there are in favour of leaving, so we could be quite close to Dexit. Uh, and I'm told the same may apply to Sweden and perhaps Austria and perhaps even Italy too. The EU's failing, the EU's dying. I hope we've knocked the first brick out of the wall. I hope this is the first step towards a Europe of sovereign nation states trading together, neighbours together, friends together, but without flags, anthems or useless old unelected presidents. Farage mentions the several nations who have shown growing support for leaving the EU. Parties in France, the Netherlands, Finland, Austria and Hungary all wish to hold referendums to leave the EU. In the most recent national elections, the resident national parties of all five nations garnered at least 10% of the vote, with the most successful taking up to 35%. Netherlands has been particularly inspired to leave the European Union, as the Dutch Party for Freedom is gaining traction and a new wave of young Dutch politicians wish to ensure the sovereignty of the country from increased European integration. The Wall Street Journal reports that, in 2015, they persuaded the Dutch Parliament to adopt a law that requires the government to hold a referendum on any law if... 300,000 citizens request it. This law could prove to be a bombshell for not only the fate of the Netherlands and the European Union, but for the fate of the European Union as a whole. Many fear that Brexit has caused a ripple effect that will spread throughout Europe. Correspondingly, politicians in France are campaigning for president, and self-proclaimed nationalist and Eurosceptic Marine Le Pen is leading public opinion polls. Le Pen is running on an anti-European platform and has promised to hold a French referendum identical to the United Kingdom's on leaving the European Union. Le Pen told Time magazine, In order to organize the referendum, I need to win the presidential elections. I'm the only major candidate that has proposed the referendum. Either the European Union says yes to me or they would say no. And I would say to the French, there is no other solution but to leave the EU. There is no question that the dismemberment of the European Union is gaining increasing support. Recent times have seen a growing Eurosceptic and nationalist movement in Western nations, and it will remain this way with public figures like Ni Nigel Farage, Marine Le Pen, and even Donald Trump showing support for this movement. The rhetoric espoused by all three politicians have been centered around taking their country back, putting their country first, and declaring a new Independence Day for their country. It is unclear whether the European Union, as well as other regional and global unions, truly infringe upon state sovereignty. But what is clear is that the argument against these unions is the hottest populist movement the world has seen in recent years. This is Jack LaForge reporting for The Global Current. Finally this morning, a previously aired interview between Zanel and Joppa and Seton Hall's Dr. Larry Green from the Edwin R. Lewinson Center for the Study of Labor, Inequality, and Social Justice. A good morning to all of our Global Current listeners. Social justice and equality are ever-relevant topics, and more so in today's world. Acknowledging this, Seton Hall University continues to encourage dialogue, research, and scholarship on these prominent topics, now through the Dr. Edwin R. Lewinson Center for the Study of Labor, Inequality, and Social Justice. These themes are further analyzed, questioned, and challenged. This morning, I'm joined by Dr. Larry Green, a professor at Seton Hall University's History Department, African American history, the Civil War and the Second World War among his specializations and interests. 
Dr. Larry Green. Welcome to the Global Current, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so now let's let's get straight into it. You not only worked alongside Dr. Lewinson, but you were also well acquainted with him. Please tell our listeners just a bit of a background about him and who he was. Well, um, Dr. Edwin Lewinson taught here for many years. Um, I believe he joined the Seton Hall faculty in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And um, I met him while a student here many, many uh -oh. years ago. Uh, I did my doctorate at Columbia, the same institution that Dr. Lewinson did his uh, doctorate at. Um, but when I met him, uh, he was teaching a number of courses on American social history, American intellectual history, and African American history. In okay. fact, he began the course in African American history here. Oh. Um, so Ed, as we all called him, um, was a wonderful man and a scholar activist. Um, Ed was a member of uh, Brooklyn Corps, okay. Congress of Racial Equality, which is one of the pioneer civil rights organizations in the 1960s, although it was formed earlier. But it took part in many of the uh, landmark marches, voter registration drives in the South, and most notably, the Freedom Rides of 1960-61. Yes. Um, so he was a member, um, as a young man, uh, in some of the pioneer civil rights activities. He went to many, many wow. marches um, in the South. I know this from hearing the stories mm -hmm. um, um, and reading about him and his own firsthand accounts of these uh, civil rights activities that he was involved in. And his interest in civil rights, civil rights continued uh, for many, many years. And in the latter stages of his life, after he had retired, he was a member of a local civil rights organization mm -hmm. called POP, or People Organized for Progress, uh, which has been involved in uh, uh, protesting uh, police brutality yes. and so forth and racial discrimination, even before Black Lives Matter okay. came along. They were involved in protesting yes. these kinds of things locally. And I remember giving a talk uh, before POP, mm -hmm. People's Organized for Progress meeting, in Newark oh. uh, at an African-American church. Mm -hmm. And Ed, who was not African-American but Jewish, was there and a member of uh, people organized for progress. Um, so he has a long history of civil rights activism. Mm -hmm. But in addition, he was interested in labor, okay. uh, workers' rights. Mm -hmm. uh, he was interested in women's rights. He was a contributor to NOW, National Organization of Women. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he was also um, an advocate for the rights of the disabled. I should mention that Ed was blind almost yes. from birth. I think around the time when he was perhaps maybe three. He uh -huh. lost, completely lost wow. all sight. Uh, it did not stop him. He continued to, to you know, graduate from high school, college, graduate school, and participate oh, in goodness. all of these activities. Wow. And uh, I remember Ed uh, and his guide dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I read about that. Yeah. Um, Hebe, Hooper, and Nelson. Uh -huh. now, I might not have them in the right order, okay. but I, I, I remember them. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and Ed's office was right in this corridor mm. um, where we are today. Yes. Not in this particular, two offices it's down, right okay. in this corridor of offices. Uh -huh. Well, it really sounds like a very inspirational man, which leads us right into, you spoke a bit about what are the exact values or facets that he exhibited that are now going to be carried through as the basis for the center? Well, I think the center, and you can get this from the title of the center, mm -hmm. is interested in social justice yes. issues. And so they're interested in issues relating to inequality, uh, that could be inequality racially, in terms of gender, um, ethnicity, religious, uh, any type of discrimination, 
that uh, makes um, any particular group or aspect of society less than equal to another. So we're interested in issues of labor uh, and inequality and social justice. Mm -hmm. In other words, inequality, labor, and social justice. Yes. And so our inaugural event, which will be on February 27th, mm -hmm. will focus on uh, this issue of race and policing um, in the community. And our speaker will be uh, Dr. Jelani Khan. Well, yeah, you definitely, I'll give you a, a chance to mm. speak a bit about that later because I'm sure our listeners would be very interested to attend, mm. as am I. And so can you just um, let us know, because we know that this is not something we, it was my first time reading about it, which made me so interested. Can you just let our, our listeners know, as well as myself, mm. as to what phase the center is currently in at the moment? Yes, well, Ed passed um, and a couple of years ago. And left uh, a significant uh, endowment to Seton Hall. He bequeathed a certain endowment to Seton Hall, and that endowment is serving as the, the endowment for the center mm -hmm. um, here on Seton Hall's campus. And what we're trying to do um, is to provide programs an education to the Seton Hall community and the general public on the kinds of values that Ed was interested in, yes. which was promoting concepts and ideas surrounding equality and social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very much interested in the plight of the poor, ordinary workers, women, the disabled, uh, racial minorities, all those that have had um, obstacles to yes. their progress and who have faced discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so to, to that extent, we are planning a variety of programs, uh, I think, over the next few years. Okay. Uh, but our inaugural program will focus on this issue mm -hmm. of racial equality. So this is actually our first year in which the board is active. You know, it takes a while administratively yes, to set these mm -hmm. things up. Um, so this, this our present academic year, 2016-2017, yes. um, mm -hmm. is our first year of actual op operation. Okay. And fall semester, we're more or less setting up the structure um, and uh, getting things started mm -hmm. and then forming an advisory board, etc. And so the February 27th uh, is our first inaugural event. And I think quite uh, symbolically, uh, it is also Black History Month. Mm -hmm. So that's very, that very. Falls quite yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of other activities also involved okay. in, um, in, in the month of February. Yes. And is, that actually leads me into my next question of what we can expect. Um, I'm, I know you can't really name drop or anything of the such, <laughs> maybe at this point, but what can we perhaps look forward to going into the future and we can expect from the center? Well, let's just talk about what we have coming up for Yay. this month. <laughs> okay. For this month, um, we are planning a sort of teach in on race, okay. which we ask uh, faculty members to set aside, this is on February 6th and 7th for okay. those classes, for professors to discuss in their classes issues relating to race. Mm -hmm. uh, we have on the web uh, made available a set of readings to our, uh, to our faculty that they could choose from although they can select their own, to discuss in their classes mm -hmm. various aspects of race in America. So the Lewin Center is cooperating with the Center for Faculty Development okay. to sponsor this on February 6th and 7th. Also, we're cooperating with the Faculty Development Center which is presenting on February 9th. Yes. 
um, at five o'clock in the Chancellor's Suite. Junius Williams, who is a scholar activist from Newark. Okay. And so I think that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, he is well known. He has written a, a book concerning Newark and civil rights and even going back to discuss the 1967 riots in oh, Newark. Newark yes. yes. And so he's well known within the greater Newark community. Um, and known at Rutgers as mm -hmm. certainly a scholar as well as an activist. On February 21st, we are having a showing at 5 o'clock in the nursing amphitheater. Mm -hmm. That's room 113. Yes. We're having a showing of Jelani Cobb, mm -hmm. uh, his film, a PBS film, uh, policing the police and this is a documentary focusing on Newark mm -hmm. although it obviously has larger importance for the entire nation as a whole uh, on this particular question of police mm -hmm. community relations but the film itself the documentary yes. itself will focus on Newark mm. so sort of using Newark as a, a, mi a microcosm of some sort Yes. Okay. And we're cooperating um, with the Faculty Development Center again. That mm -hmm. 21st was the Lewinson Center. The Faculty Development Center and the Lewinson Center are cooperating on a faculty student symposium on the issue of race. And that's going to be between 9 and 12 o'clock in. Uh, I think room 110 mm -hmm. of yes. Stafford Hall. Okay. February 27th, our uh, large event yes. will be Jelani Cobb himself talking at 5 o'clock in mm -hmm. Jubilee Hall Auditorium. Oh, lovely. Okay. Well, the Dr. Edwin R. Lewinson Center for the Study of Labor, Inequality, and Social Justice promises to play a critical role at not only Seton Hall Uni University, but for the surrounding community in themes relating to civil and human rights. We're certainly looking forward to getting involved and witnessing the growth and prosperity of this center. Dr. Larry Green, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Global Current. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm Priya Bave. And I'm Adeline Patterson. Same time same place next week the global current is brought to you by the school of diplomacy and international relations at seton hall university our executive producers liam scollins our associate producers morgan mount our news editor is josh doe our analysis editor is marissa hutton our technical producer is trevor west and our interview segment was produced by zanella joppa special thank you to dr larry green the global current theme song is acid jazz by kevin mcleod you've been listening to the global current on wsou 89.5 fm seton hall's pirate radio Thank you.